So uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining us tonight for this uh, installment of the, the AMSSM National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Um, before we get started with tonight's talk, I do wanna highlight the next talk, which is gonna be on November 24th at one Eastern time on sports psychology with uh, Vicki Nelson as a speaker and Irf um, Asif will serve as the moderator for that talk. Um, for tonight's talk, um, the pleasure of having Dr. Eric Wagner is one of my colleagues here at Emory. I'll talk about neurogenic thoracic outlet and, and uh, brachial plexopathy or other plexus syndromes. Uh, like I said, he's a, a colleague of mine here at Emory. He did his orthopedic surgery residency at Mayo and then followed that up with, um, with two fellowships, one in hand in microvascular surgery at Mayo uh, and another in, in shoulder at Harvard, where it's also an international fellowship where he trained with world leaders uh, in France as well. So he's been in Emory since 2018. He's extensively published with over 180 peer reviewed journal articles, 280 national presentations, over 10 book chapters. Um, so early on in his career, he's, he's established himself as a, as a national leader and then he's quickly establishing himself as, as a world expert in, in neurogenic thoracic outlet. And, and we, we um, share patients together at Emory for this condition. And I think he's just an excellent, uh, excellent mind to pick on this topic. Uh, and know he's going to give a great talk tonight. So I'll go ahead and um, uh, I do want to cover our um, the reasoning for this. So this uh, for the lecture series, this is to serve as an adjunct to each individual fellows programs, educational programming. It is not to take the place of anything. We want to provide the fellows with direct access to educational experience through both AMSSN members and invited guests, such as tonight in a variety of formats. Uh, and then overall, hopefully these will serve as an adjunct and help to prepare for CAQ exam preparation. So with that said, we've handled all of these things. Um, if you do have a question during the talk, just go ahead and put it in the chat function. We'll let Dr. Wagner finish his talk. And then at the end of the talk, um, if, if you put your questions in Q and A, um, you can submit questions through chat or Q&A actually. Um, and then we will also um, put the evaluation into the chat function if you'll follow that link to fill that out at the end of the lecture. So with that said, I'll let Dr. Widener take it away. Fantastic. Thank you, Bowers. Um, Bowers, you can see my screen, right? Yep. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much. This is my honor uh, to uh, be able to give this talk. So where I'm going to talk about neurogenic thoracic outlet uh, and some other brachial plexus syndromes, um, the idea of kind of introducing you to some considerations about radiating shoulder pain, what to think about when you have patients like these, and some um, both established and novel ways to approach this. So my name is Eric Widener. As our, um, Dr. Byers mentioned, I'm one of his partners at Emory and um, Although I do have disclosures, none are really relevant to this presentation, um, but I should disclose I am a product of my mentors, particularly in the shoulder world, both within the United States and abroad, and a lot of them have helped to serve how I approach and how I think about this relatively complex and kind of novel topic that we have. So I'm going to start out with a quick case study. You have this radiating shoulder pain, so either it's anterior or posterior, but in, in general, radiating shoulder pain. So like this 20 year old female play, a softball player presents with pain, paresthesias, and kind of pain that radiates around her anterior shoulder. It gets worse with row activities. It's limiting her ability to play collegiate softball. She has uh, pain with most motions, even at rest, and um, her shoulder subjective area, so rating her shoulder from zero to 100, she rates as a 25%. Otherwise she's healthy. Um, as I mentioned, she's a collegiate softball player. So. This radiant shoulder pain, we're going to go through some of the causes that can cause these athletes or, or even older patients to have this kind of radiant shoulder pain and what to think about. So naturally, we're going to go cover thoracic outlet syndrome, suprachapter neuropathy, so some scapular problems, whether it's dyskinesia or weaning, um, quadrile space syndrome. And then obviously, whenever you're thinking about radiant sh shoulder pain, hand pain, elbow pain, you always have to see and think about cervical radiculopathy. So real quick though, just kind of give you some background about the shoulder and why I think it's the most fascinating joint in the body. Well, partly it's because it has so many planes of motion and partly it has so many articulations that contribute to all these different planes of motion that are able to withstand such incredible forces. 
So if you look at the normal shoulder versus a shoulder that has a massive rotator cuff tear, you can see how much the scapular thoracic is moved, has scapular thoracic joints moving, as well as the actual glenohumeral joint itself. And you can see in this patient that has a massive rotator cuff tear, how it translates up. And you're really just dependent on only scapular thoracic motion. There's really no glenohumeral motion that's happening in this. And this is what comes to the idea of this shoulder joint. So the shoulder joint consists of not only the glenohumeral joint that we all focus on, we all talk about with regards to the rotator cuff and you know, instability in the labrum, but also the scapular thoracic joints, as well as the AC and SC. But really the scapular thoracic joint, as you can see this dynamic floor of a normal shoulder, it contributes a huge amount to elevation, huge amount to abduction, huge amount to internal and external rotation. The, so that when you're thinking about patients, when you're rehabbing patients, it's, and when you're, when you're approaching um, um, pathology, it's not always going to hear more pathology that you're dealing with. So on this topic and kind of going into um, thinking about some of these syndromes that are associated with plexus and some of this radiating shoulder pain, I'm going to give you sort of a quick background on brachial plexus on some of the syndromes that are associated with it and, uh, and then kind of go into both anterior and posterior radiating shoulder pain. So the plexus, as many of you know, it supplies the whole upper extremity. So from the shoulder all the way down to the fingertip, from C5 to T1, um, there's many different trunks and branches and cords. This is a case study of a patient who presents after a shoulder dislocation with an inability to move or move the shoulder. And that's really what, besides a car crash, this is another very common situation where you have a patient who presents after a dislocation, especially an older patient, and all of a sudden they can't move their shoulder. So this patient is under 40 naturally and they dislocate their shoulder. You're going to work it up like you would with many of the football players and other athletes that you see. You're going to get an MRI. You're going to suspect a labral or a glenoid injury. But if they're over 40, you're really thinking more of like a rotator cuff injury or an axillary nerve injury. And naturally, you start out with an MRI, but you know, these younger patients, especially those less than 40, you'd want to get an MRI arthrogram and then consider something like a bank card or a ladder J. But in these older patients, or maybe it's a younger patient that has a pretty severe um, uh, football injury that's associated with dislocation, you're thinking about either a rotator cuff injury or even more relevant to this discussion, a brachial plexus injury. So these brachial plexus injuries can be traumatic. So it can be these low energy stingers that many of you have probably seen and evaluated. They can be high energy, like car accidents or, or these shoulder dislocations I showed you earlier. Or in Atlanta, we're, we're lucky enough to see a lot of iatrogenic or penetrating brachial plexus injuries. The classic patterns are either a shoulder injury, so a shoulder or elbow weakness, as in the upper trunk, or hand weakness in a lower trunk injury. And the treatment, not really relevant to this discussion, but um, you, you'll work them up with EMGs, myelograms, MRIs, serial examinations. There's various different treatments you can do for these, whether you're talking about nerve grafts or transfers, even tendon transfers. Um, but, but why I bring up brachial plexus injuries and the whole idea of brachial plexus is when somebody shows up and they can't move their shoulder or they have significant weakness in the shoulder, you think about the brachial plexus, you think about brachial plexus injuries, naturally, if they're older, the massive rotator cuff tears are an important consideration, but this is also an important consideration. So Parsonage Turner or brachial plexus neuritis, Parsonage Turner is thought to be associated with an upper respiratory illness. So often patients will have a viral URI, and then shortly after this viral URI, they'll have this sudden, severe shoulder pain associated with gradual onset of muscle atrophy without any obvious injury, meaning that they all of a sudden can't move their shoulder. And now they're showing up and they didn't have an injury. They weren't in a football accident. They weren't in a car accident, yet they can't move their shoulder. Maybe it's their scapula. Maybe it's their, their actual shoulder itself. Um, but some aspect of the shoulder, usually their shoulder, it has some sort of dysfunction. Um, like I said, many patients have that history of viral URI, but not all patients. So sometimes you get lucky and on MRIs, you'll see this, this hyper intensity of, of the muscle, like in this teres minor. Now this could also be quadrilateral space syndrome, but nonetheless, this does help to confirm this diagnosis because naturally this is diagnosis of exclusion. And ultimately what's so hard about Parson and Scherner is most patients recover, but it sometimes takes years, at least one year. 90% um, of patients by one year do fully recover. 
But in the meantime, you know, patients actually are not going to be patient. They can't move their shoulder. They can't move their scapula. They can't move their arm. And they're markedly market have a marked dysfunction. Um, surgery is quite controversial and not something that I'm sort of going to go into in this. But really, when you are treating these patients, it's really sort of maintaining what motion they have and trying to um, trying to help their scapula, their rotator cuff, whatever it is that's paralyzed to really recover. All right, so now I'm going to get to the more the meat of the conversation or meat of our talk. So we're going to talk about anterior and posterior radiating shoulder pain. So you have a patient that shows up and has anterior radiating shoulder pain. There's multiple different things you can think about. Thoracic outlet syndrome without question is one thing that's, um, you know, previously thought to be relatively rare. I think we're realizing it's actually more common than you think. Pectoralis minor syndrome, which is basically like thoracic outlet syndrome or neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, but just really isolated to the pectoralis minor. And then naturally the AC joint can, can have radiating pain all over the place. Christian Gerber did a really nice study kind of showing the different manifestations of AC, you know, AC joint pathology. Bicep synoptic can make the patients feel like they're having pain kind of going up and down their arm. And then obviously any type of cervical or radiopathy is important to consider. But we're gonna talk about thoracic outlet syndrome or pectoralis minor syndrome. So for TOS or for, or for um, thoracic outlet syndrome, Vascular thoracic outlet syndrome is sort of one of the classic things that we used to think about and that we used to always talk about and that we used to always sort of approach and treat. So vascular thoracic outlet is, is these vessels are emerging underneath the clavicle between the clavicle and the first rib. Um, they also um, have associations with the anterior middle scaling. Um, most of the time when you have vascular thoracic outlet, the symptoms are in the hand, not the shoulder. And patients have this Renaud type of, of, of symptoms. So this claudication in their hands. An angiogram or an MRI will show some, some narrowing of the actual vessels, um, especially if you do the provocative angiograms. And this test, the Adson test, has, has been thought to reduce the radial pulse when you extend the arm to the defective side, basically compressing the clavicle against the vessels um, and the first rib and inhaling deeply, trying to sort of compress those vessels and see if you feel a reduced radial pulse. I'm going to talk about neurogenic thoracic outlet, though, because really neurogenic thoracic outlet is the most common. Many studies have suggested 95 to 98 percent of patients who have thoracic outlet actually have neurogenic thoracic outlet. And I think that number is probably even higher as we're, we're learning more and more about this pathology. So you can either have compression within the interscaling triangle, it's a little bit less common, or more commonly below the pectoralis minor. So most of these patients will have anterior shoulder tightness. They'll feel like their shoulder is kind of, or their, their scap is kind of protracted around. Many will have scapular dyskinesia. Many also will have radiating pain and paresthesis. Now, not all of them have radiating pain and paresthesis, but many of them do. Usually it's associated with repetitive overuse, particularly overhead athletes. The most common I've seen are softball players, volleyball players, basketball players, gymnasts. It's repetitive overuse of overloading or, or loading their, their, um, their, their front part of their chest. You know, weightlifters also have a, have a big issue with this. Um, and the examination, and I'll go through this in a little bit more detail, but often the scapula won't move perfectly with normally. They'll have tenderness either at, in the scalene or at the uh, medial to the coracoid, right near the pectoralis minor insertion. And often they'll have a positive supraschapular stretch test. And I'll show you what that is in a second. So these are, these are the different described examination maneuvers that have been classically described in the vascular surgery literature. So the adsin test, as I mentioned, for neurogenic thoracic outlet, you extend it to the affected side, you inhale deeply, and you see if you have pain radiating down the arm. The Roos test is where you externally rotate and abduct. You pump the hand for three or four minutes, and then you see if the patients have the worsening symptoms or rapid fatigue. The right test is where you externally rotate and abduct the arm to 180 degrees. You inhale deeply and you see if you have radiating or worsening pain. But these all have high, high false positives. And, I, and if I can be frank, I actually don't really use them that much. I do look at them, but I don't consider them as the make or break in this diagnosis. This is an example of, of, of some of the examinations I like to use. So tenels in the interscaling triangle, tenels at the coracoid or just medial of the coracoid. This is kind of the arm extension and stretch test of, for those pec minus and minor and suprachapular nerve. This is the suprachapular nerve stretch test where you're kind of stretching the arm back and then obviously looking at the scapula. And this is looking at the scapula and you can see it's a little bit subtle, but she has this dyskinetic pattern where her scapula is not rotating properly and it prevents her from lifting her arm up all the way. 
There's multiple other measurements that you can do. So the pectoralis minor index is where you measure from the coracoid to the fourth rib, basically measuring the length of the pectoralis minor. And then you divide it by the patient's height and you multiply it by 100. And this is a way if you do it contralaterally, um, if you have a, a sort of a 10 to 20% decrease, that's thought to be associated with the pectoralis minor tightness or pectoralis minor syndrome. You have scapular protraction height, medium, the medial scapular angle, and the medial scapular height. All of these different measurements they can use to kind of help confirm that one side is different than the other. The scapula is not moving the same, and you have these sort of abnormalities within the scapula that you can sort of try to quantify. To diagnose it, really, you can look at a brachioplexus MRI, and we do get those. EMGs are important, and sometimes with POS, you actually see not necessarily the, the classic um, antibrachiocutaneous nerve that people describe, but actually more commonly, you'll see suprascapular neuropathy um, that, that presents in these patients. So the supraspinatus and infranatus have some innervation problems. And then diagnostic injections are without question the mainstay to both diagnose and at least start treatment on this. So these diagnostic injections, you can see here, this is provided by my partner, Robbie Bowers. Um, Nero Jonathan and, and Kim Mountner also contribute, but um, as you can see how Robbie is able to demonstrate the petros minor with the uh, vessels and the nerves surrounding the vessels underneath it. Um, you can see as you move over to the coracoid, once again, you can see the vessels and the nerves kind of underneath it. And this video kind of really nicely shows the pectoralis minor going right over the top of the brachial plexus with these nerves um, and, uh, and obviously the actually actually already just underneath it. So it kind of shows why it could be compressed and why, why this could be, an, why this often can be an issue. And this also is a nice, a nice uh, dynamic uh, video where you can kind of see moving from adduction to abduction, how you can have compression of these nerves, particularly against the rib case, particularly if that pectoralis minor is a little bit overactive. So how do I diagnose neurogenic thoracic outlet? Well, Tendels or tendinous probation at the medial to the pectoralis minor, a positive stretch test, so bringing the arm behind and kind of stretching the pectoralis minor against the chest wall, scapular dyskinesia or some sort of abnormalities within the scapula, a positive response to ultrasound guided injections within the pectoralis minor and or the uh, suprascapular notch, and a negative vascular um, angi angiography. And uh, an EMG workup that maybe will localize to the to the uh, suprachiasmal nerve, but really won't uh, show any signs of super cervical radiculopathy or anything else that shows of compressive neuropathy. When you refer patients to therapy, this unilateral course, corner stretch is one of my favorites. It really stretches out the pectoralis minor, stretches out that anterior chest. Um, you also want to do some scapular strengthening, postural correction. Um, Remember when you do these, these things, deltoid and rotator cuff strengthening actually can make it worse. It actually contracts the anterior chest down potentially more. It won't necessarily help. This is really more of a scapular and kind of chest wall uh, phenomenon. Really important to focus on the scapula, really important to retrain that scapular humoral rhythm. So coordinating the scapula and the humerus to basically work together and kind of move together without that, that kind of bumping disconnect pattern. Um, and there's multiple different therapies that you can think about. So, so the scapular retraction, sleeper stretch, seated pushups, butterflies. These are some of the ones I think are really helpful and really useful. There's many other ones that you can consider, but they're all about stretching and strengthening your, your scapula, your scapular humoral rhythm, and kind of this coordinated retraining of how patient, these patients move their shoulders. I really like TL, TLSL patients don't actually really like that much, but I actually really like these figure of eight uh, braces. So, so this is what we traditionally used to use for clavicle fractures, but you can get these figure of eight braces very cheaply off the internet or at most brace shops. And it kind of really helps to hold the scapula back, hold the back, hold the, uh, the patient's posture and really kind of improve their, their scapular humor mechanics. One quick note, so scapular winging or scapular dyskinesia are not necessarily automatically neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. So I know I was talking about this idea of scapular winging a lot, but I want to want to sort of mention this that as you can see in these two certain circumstances, the so serratus anterior or long thoracic palsy, you can see in this young lady, her her scapula is basically paralyzed. It's 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 uh, it's no longer able to be protracted against against the chest wall, and you can see kind of how it pops out, and she was very very limited in how much she can use it. 
the trapezius paralysis or spinal accessory paralysis, you can see he lost all of his external rotation of his scapula. So he's unable to lift his arm because he lost this external rotation. Instead, the scapula just rotates around the body and no longer does he have the scapular external rotation. So you think about this as lateral and medial, but it's really a loss of retraction against the body and a loss of lateral or a loss of external rotation of the trapezius. You can treat both these with a pectoralis minor transfer, may, sorry, pectoralis major transfer or the uh, triple transfer. And just really quick, I know this is a little bit outside the topic of this, but this is an example of scapular winging different from scapular dyskinesia. So this is a patient, 18 year old with scapular winging, shoulder pain for about a year and a half. She had a fall during cheerleading. Um, she was significant pain, significant winging and had failed extensive shoulder scapular therapy. Um, she was even being considered for a labral repair, but naturally this wasn't really her main cause and ultimately did not undergo that surgery. Um, her shoulder spectacular was 10% and she really, really was quite limited with this. And you'll see um, on, this, in, on this video how limited she was. So her trapezius and rhomboids were intact but she really was not able to lift her arm because her scapula sort of lost that retraction against the chest wall. Um, she had normal chondral shoulder and she did not have any signs of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or any other hyperlaxity. But you can see here, she has this like scapula that's protruding out and is unable to be sort of stay against the chest wall because her serratus anterior is not working very well. You can see here, I'm testing the strength of her serratus anterior by having her push against it. You can see on the other side, she's very strong, but on this side, she has basically no strength. And this is a really uncomfortable test for patients, but this is me holding the scapula reduced against the chest wall. You can see I can completely correct her ability to elevate her arm. Um, basically, I'm doing the function of the serratus anterior. You can see in, in these images, they're basically normal, normal x-rays, normal images, although you could see why one of the surgeons thought she potentially had some posterior labral instability. Um, her brachial plexus MRI was basically normal, but um, her EMG did show some long thoracic readings. Um, and so you have this patient who have, has a long thoracic um, uh, inner denervation, um, no open injury, but a, a, a likely a blunt or stretch trauma. Um, so what do you do for this patient? Well, she had been referred to a sports psychologist. She'd been referred to a variety of other, other people um, as, as, as sort of um, a variety of other surgeons to bounce around for a bit. But ultimately, we did decide to actually treat this with a, um, after an interoperative uh, EMG showed that there was no simulation. I'll just show this quick uh, animation. So you, we did this uh, sternal head of the pectoralis major transfer. So you take off the clavicular head, you then pass the sternal head of the pectoralis major, back on basically right next to the chest wall and you kind of how it, you can kind of imagine how it mimics the serratus anterior and then you attach it in so once again you kind of see how the sternal head can can mimic the serratus anterior you attach it into this inferior angle of the scapula reattach the clavicular head of the pectoralis major back to its insertion you can kind of see the ultimate outcome so you still have the clavicular head so you still have that contour of the anterior chest wall but your, the, the sternal head is now um, attached to the inferior angle of the, of the scapula, as you can kind of see here. We wrote about this and looked up this, uh, this study showing very good overall outcomes with this transfer. And you can see in this patient, so preoperatively versus postoperatively, we were able to use this transfer to basically correct her shoulder. Now you can see how her scapula moves. She's able to lift her arms completely overhead and she really doesn't have any, any limitations. She was able to go back um, she's now in college now, so she's not actually competitively cheering, but she was able to go back to doing a variety of different activities without any real limitations. All right, so moving on to posterior radiating shoulder pain. So when you think about posterior radiating shoulder pain, there's a couple of things I want you to sort of have in your mind. Naturally, cervical radiculopathy. So if you have anything in your neck, it can cause anterior shoulder pain, it can cause posterior shoulder pain, cause pain going down to your elbow, down to your hand. But also consider the suprascapular nerve entrapment. You can also consider a little bit more rare quadrilateral space syndrome. And then naturally problems with the scapula. So dyskinesia, winging, or even bursitis, scapulothoracic bursitis. And naturally the AC joint really can be associated with a variety of different, um, different issues, including posterior radiating shoulder pain. So suprascapular neuropathy, and you probably have heard about this, but potentially maybe not as much as, 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 um, as, as it maybe do, given how common or relatively common this actually is, is turning out to be. So suprascapular neuropathy, the suprascapular nerve goes through this really tight space, this really tight ligament, and it travels into the suprascapular or the supracinus fossa and then the infracinus fossa. 
So you can imagine the only other two places in the body you have a ligament traveling, I mean, a nerve traveling under a tight ligament is the carpal tunnel and the cubal tunnel. So we have entrapment and very, very common entrapment in both of those. You can imagine you also have entrapment in this, in this situation as well. So superapic nerve comes from C5 and C6. It innervates the supraspinaceous and the infraspinaceous muscles. Um, and, and often these patients will have a deep kind of medial shoulder pain. Sometimes they'll have a radiating posterior shoulder pain. Sometimes they'll have a weak state percentage to infrastate, but really it's more the deep kind of radiating posterior shoulder pain because this nerve is both a motor and sensory nerve and the sensory component of it travels through the bursa around the posterior aspect of the shoulder. To diagnose this, diagnostic ultrasound guided injections are without question the mainstay of treatment for this. Um, Robbie Bowers and many of my colleagues are, are very, very good at this, very skilled at this, and they're able to visualize the nerve coming through the notch and then um, inject lidocaine plus steroids and, and potentially treat, but even more commonly, um, diagnose this. And that just like you do with a, a guided injection into the carpal tunnel or cubal tunnel, you can really diagnose this pathology based off of these injections. You can... When you think about superior neuropathy, you wanna think about the spinal glenoid notch disc that's often associated with the posterior labral injury. But even more commonly, the suprascapular notch or this, this, this entrapment at the suprascapular notch, I think is, is, is even more common than, than that spinal glenoid notch disc. So once again, you wanna do a variety of different therapies and very similar to the pectoralis minor, scapular strengthening, stretching, postural correction, stabilizing your scapula, correcting your posture and your scapular humor rhythm and really focusing on your ability to, to sort of correct your mechanics of your shoulder. But this is particularly important for athletes and often we'll have uh, athletes do whatever sporting event that they're doing in these figure eight braces to really kind of focus on correcting this and, and getting this, uh, getting this, their, 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 their mechanics and their motion back. And then these are just like, as I mentioned earlier, some of my favorite ones, literally, literally focusing on the scapula. There's many other ones as well. So suprascapular neuropathy um, can be treated arthroscopically as well. And that, naturally, this is not the point of this test, but this just kind of does kind of show you that um, this, this ligament and kind of gives you a visualization of why you'd have an issue with suprascapular neuropathy. So you can see the ligament. You can see us cutting the ligament with these arthroscopic scissors, and you can see this nerve coming then through the ligament. And you can kind of imagine why this nerve would be compressed in this really tight space underneath this ligament. So quadrilateral space syndrome. So this is another one that you want to consider when you have posterior radiating shoulder pain. It's a little bit less common than something like suprachiaphal neuropathy, but nonetheless, it's something to consider, particularly when to isolate that posterior axillary fold. So really for athletes, it's those pitchers or the overhead athletes that get this. Often it's males and often it's weightlifters or, or relatively bulky patients. Um, this is where the axillary nerve and the posterior humeral circumflex artery travel through the teres minor, teres major, and the triceps. And you can kind of see the anatomy here. So you have your teres minor, you have your teres major, and you have the axillary nerve traveling through this tight space here. And then the axillary nerve wraps around naturally and innervates the deltoid. So often patients will have pain in that posterior axillary fold. They'll have this posterior radiating shoulder pain around their shoulder. Um, and it gets worse with abduction versus seductional rotation. So this shows an ex uh, example of this, this posterior axillary pain. So right in that posterior axillary fold, patients will have pain there. They have pain with resisted abduction external rotation. So you're getting the teres minor to fire. And they have pain when they're, when they're firing the teres minor because it's compressing that axillary nerve. Um, and, and then actually they, they have a, a right of weakness. Once again, that posture actually pain that the patients are having. So when you, sometimes you'll get lucky when looking at this and sometimes you'll get an MRI and you'll actually be able to see this, this, this cyst that's sitting in the um, uh, quadrilateral space. Now, not always, not, not always are the, are the patients MRI positive. And sometimes you'll get lucky with the EMG and show denervation at the actual nerve. Once again, not always. When you treat this, you really want to focus on the rotator cuff. You want to focus on the scapula. And really, the ultrasound-guided injections are the mainstay of both the treatment and the diagnosis. So you want the injections. You want patients to get better with injections to confirm your diagnosis. But also, often, these injections will treat this pathology. It'll help with some of the inflammation that's around the nerve. And surgery really is only an option once you've failed extensive amount of both physical therapy and injections. And it's not something that we like to jump to at all very quickly in this. 
So as we stated earlier, you really want to focus on the scapula and the scapular humeral rhythm. And I'm going to show just a quick uh, case study of this. So you have this patient that is a power lifter, worsening pain over 10 years. The pain is, is no, no prior injury, but the pain is located in the posterior axillary fold. Uh, it radiates around the shoulder posteriorly. He is a chronic methadone user and thus has been pushed around for the last couple of years, basically told that he doesn't have anything um, wrong with him that's in his head, that he's a, he's a chronic pain user, et cetera, et cetera. His shoulder subjectile is 5%, and his VSS score is a, is, a, is a 9 to a 10 out of 10. He works in construction, and he does like powerlifting. You can see, and he gave me a position to show, show you this. So he has pain with uh, resisted abduction and external rotation. You can see he's quite painful in most motion of the shoulder. But he's this guy it was actually painful around his pec minor on the anterior part of his shoulder. As you can see, when I tap there and when I pushed, you can see how his, his shoulder is almost kind of rotated around or his scap is rotated around and kind of protracted. You can imagine how the pectoralis minor kind of being tight would cause this. And then you can see how he's, he's relatively limited in what he can do based off his pain. Um, he has tenderness palpation, not only at the pectoralis minor, but he also has tenderness palpation at his, um, knee, at his um, posterior axillary fold. And he has pain, as you saw earlier, with resisted abduction and external rotation when he's in 90 degrees of abduction. In general, his imaging was relatively normal. His plain radiographs showed no real abnormalities. There, weren't, there wasn't much label pathology, maybe a, a small, subtle uh, slap tear. But this is the gentleman who had this cyst that you can see that was sitting in his posterior, in his uh, quadrilateral space. And just because you see a cyst in the quadrilateral space does not necessarily mean that's the, that's the diagnosis. But it is important to combine that with an injection with an EMG and see if there actually is, is, is denervation and see if there actually is response to the injections. So this guy got very good relief from the quadrilateral space injection. So if I say you get, if you get greater than 50% relief from that injection, I, I consider that a positive response. Um, he got very good relief from the pectoralis minor injection. So he got 85% relief from that injection, but nothing from the supratrapper nerve. And then before getting to me, he had multiple subacromal injections and glenohumeral injections that did not give him relief. So, what do you do in this methadone, a chronic methadone user who has what appears to be some pathology associated with the pectoralis minor and his quadrilateral space? Do you continue with non-operative management? He's already seen multiple psychologists, including being seen in the pain clinic, or, or do we release? And well, we ended up not just releasing the quadrilateral space, but actually also his pectoralis minor. Um, and not necessarily going into the surgical technique of this, but this kind of shows, you know, not all of these patients are crazy. Now, we definitely have plenty of these patients who are you know, there is a significant psychological component to this. Um, but sometimes they actually have these real pathologies that really can do. And you can see at two weeks, he was already weaning off methadone. I don't have the eight week video, but at eight weeks, you know, he was basically back to almost normal. Um, and this is after 10 years of dealing with this. So some of these patients do have real pathology and they do, um, they do have something that can be treated. So, Sort of before I go into um, go into this final thought, I hope you're getting a sense that we're kind of talking about a variety of different pathologies ranging all kind of around the brachial plexus or branches off the brachial plexus um, associated with scapodyskinesia, thoracic outlet. They're kind of all tied together in a lot of respects. And that's what we're kind of learning as a field is how these all can be kind of tied together and how they're actually not as uncommon as we think and how that many of these can, can be treated both with, without surgery and with surgery. So once again, when you're thinking about these patients with radiating shoulder pain, whether it's radiating anterior shoulder pain or radiating posterior shoulder pain, obviously you wanna think about their neck. Obviously you wanna make sure they don't have some sort of cervical problem, cervical radiculopathy. Particularly in these young athletes, though, you want to think about, is this a neurogenic thoracic outlet? Is this a compression of the, of the nerves as they travel underneath the pectoralis minor? Is this a superscapular neuropathy? Is this something of this tight, tight ligament, that tight space where that nerve is traveling under, just like the carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel? I mean, these are compressive neuropathies that we don't talk about all the time. Is there something else like the quadrilateral space or partial insurner that's contributing to this patient's pathologies? So here's an example. We, I talked about this at the beginning. So a 20 year old female that has pain, paresthesias and weakness. She gets worse with over activities. She has pain that radiates down her arm. She, this has been going on for a little over a year. Her shoulder subjective value is 25%. She has tried extensive both injections and physical therapy, including 
I want to say somewhere between three and six months of therapy with with um, a therapist that I personally work with on a regular basis. She is a, was a collegiate, is a collegiate softball player, but has been really limited and had to sit out her, her, her um, sophomore season. And once again, you've seen this, or I showed this, this video earlier, but she has a positive tenels at her pec minor, but not at, not at her uh, scaling. She has a positive stretch test, as you can kind of see here. She did have a positive um, a super scapula, not stress test as well. She did not have any signs of neurogenic, thora I mean, of vascular thoracic outlet syndrome, but she did have some signs of neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome and some scapular dyskinesia, or just some ir irregularity or asymmetry when you look at both scapulas and how they kind of moved. Imaging was basically no uh, normal. She was referred to me by one of my sports colleagues who had diagnosed her with a slap tear and was actually considering a slap repair, but didn't really feel like her symptoms matched the slap pathology. On EMG, she did have some signs of supraspinatus and infraspinatus denervation. Now, they still worked, but they were being slightly denervated, so that she did have some signs of suprascapular neuropathy. Her CT angiogram or TS protocol was basically negative. Her brachial plexus MRI was negative and her C-spine was negative for a pretty extensive workup. Now, so we do this extensive workup for her, but then we also do an ultrasound guided injection into a superior notch and into her pectoral minor. So, so Dr. Bowers did both of these, gave her very good relief with the uh, superior notch and, and with the lidocaine only injection to, into the pectoral minor, she got 75% pain and functional relief. And I called her that night. I call most of these patients the night of, ask them to do a variety of different activities to ask them to see if they actually get relief from these injections. And she did. So what do you do for this patient? Well, there's a variety of different options and there's a variety of different considerations in what her actual diagnosis is. Um, but I'm just gonna show you this quick surgical video. I realized that, that um, this is uh, out, of, out of your realm of, of what your concern for, but I do want you to see this because it helps you to see not only the superscapular nerve release. So this is the superscapular super um, notch. And this is, look how, how much inflammation is around that ligament. So there's the ligament kind of coming across here. And this is all the inflammation around there. And you can see we're using these, these tiny little fancy arthroscopic scissors to clean off and eventually cut that ligament. Um, but once again, see all this inflammation around her actual nerve. And this is, this is a 20 year old collegiate softball player. You can see then we were able to release the nerve and you can see how open her nerve is and how, how, how much inflammation you can imagine how much, how, why she'd have compression of that nerve in that area. And then once again, you can see um, her nerve being nice and released. So now, this is, this is at the superscapular notch. Now, just as you do with an ultrasound, you go from the back of the coracoid, which is at the superscapular notch, where you, where, you, where you visualize when you're doing that injection, and you're moving all the way to the front part of the shoulder. So basically from the, from the kind of the back part of the shoulder to the front part of the shoulder. And now you see, we, we kind of turn the camera and they're looking back down into the shoulder. So this is looking at the front and down back into the shoulder. This is your CA ligament. This is your coracoid. This is your conjoint tendon. So now I'm, I'm exposing the, from the conjoint tendon, the pectoralis minor. So the pectoralis minor is over here on this side, kind of deep inserting onto the, the conjoint area, deep inside here. You can see the pectoralis minor inserting onto this coracoid. So here arthroscopically, we're releasing the pectoralis minor off of its coracoid. You can see you do this kind of carefully because naturally there's some really important vessels and very important nerves right underneath it. But you have this really nice visualization doing it arthroscopically. And I, I would submit to you, it's much safer to do it arthroscopically than open, much lower risk of complications. You have much sort of a much better visualization. You can see this is the, the pumping is the actually artery, the nerves, the brachial plexus all around there. You can see the pectoral minor and how far it's actually retracted back from the coracoid. So you can kind of see here, you know, you had the coracoid over here and the pectoralis minor has, has not only been released, but it retracted all the way back. So it kind of shot like a slingshot all the way back. And I can't even bring it back into the coracoid. So you can see this patient did quite well. Two weeks afterwards, her, her pain was basically gone. We just let her start moving. Eight weeks afterwards, pain was gone. Um, her shoulder surrector was 85% back from, if you remember, I think you believe it was like 10% preoperatively. And then by 16 weeks, she was already back playing softball. And you can see it was around Christmas time, but she was already back playing softball. Um, she had uh, sent me multiple videos and multiple pictures of her uh, her uh, playing third base and was able to uh, to get back. And, and now she currently is playing, well, up until coronavirus was playing softball. So I'm going to kind of leave you with a couple things. One, um, if you're approached with a patient that has a paralyzed shoulder, 
meaning that they can't move their shoulder, whether a young patient, an older patient, somewhere in between. You think about brachial plexus injuries, especially that upper trunk, C5, C6, C7 brachial plexus injury. If they don't have a history of an injury, think about Parsons Turner syndrome. Um, as, as this is and does happen, now it doesn't always last a year and often it'll resolve relatively quickly, but sometimes it does last up to a year. And it is important to consideration when you're thinking about a patient, particularly with the history of severe shoulder pain without a specific injury. And naturally you wanna think about a massive rotator cuff tear, particularly those that are irreparable can really mimic these, uh, these brachial plexus injuries. If you have anterior radiating shoulder pain, you can think about thoracic outlet syndrome. And that's really, if I see a patient with anterior radiating shoulder pain and it's not biceps, meaning it's not in their biceps, it's actually like more chest or anterior part of their shoulder kind of radiating down their, their arms. You think about thoracic outlet syndrome, you can naturally always think about cervical radiculopathy because all of these can be mimicked by cervical radiculopathy. But nonetheless, thoracic outlet syndrome is an important and, and, and I think much more common than we realize consideration, particularly in these athletes, particularly in overhead athletes. And then finally, posterior radiating shoulder pain. So a patient has pain that's either medial in their shoulder or medial in the shoulder that kind of radiates posteriorly. Think about the suprachapular nerve, as I showed you on those, so those surgical videos and some of those diagrams. I mean, it's a tight, tight canal that it travels through in the suprachapular notch. You can think about quadral space syndrome. Now that's much less common, but the axillary nerve as it travels between the teres minor and teres major, you can imagine it can get compressed back there. And you, then you think about scapular dyskinesia or scapular winging. Naturally, scapular problems can drive or can be symptoms of many of these other problems. They're important to consider when you're examining a patient, I employ all of the residents and all the fellows that work with me, make the patient, whether it's a, a female, make them take off their shirt and put in a gown, or it's a male, make them take off their shirt and please look at their scapula. So many patients get misdiagnosed because nobody ever took the time to look at their scapula and to see if their scapula was actually contributing to some of these pathologies. So if I can teach you anything or encourage anybody who's listening to this, anything from this talk, it's, it's pay not only attention to the rotator cuff that we talk about all the time or the labrum that we talk about all the time and that are very important and relevant, but think about some of these other pathologies and particularly look and, and think about the scapula as a contribution to a lot of these different, especially kind of unique or chronic pathologies that people have not been diagnosed on before. So I'd like to thank you for your time. This is my cell phone. Please um, feel free to text me or email me with any questions. This is all my, also, my, also my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or any comments. Um, I'd love to uh, talk to you more. I can send you articles. I can send you our therapy protocols. I can send you um, uh, Dr. Bowers and my protocol for how to work up and, and, and diagnose thoracic outlet syndrome and a variety of these other policies, as well as happy to uh, weigh in my, my opinion on anything. So please feel free to reach out to me and don't, uh, don't hesitate. So um, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll turn this back over to uh, Robbie Bowers or Dr. Bowers. Thanks, Eric. That was great. Um, you know, since since I started uh, working with Dr. Wagner, I've learned so much about thoracic outlet syndrome and some of these these different conditions and and how much more common they are than than what we previously believed. Um, and because of working with him, a super scapular notch injection is now in my you know my toolbox of something that I use very, very frequently um, for, for shoulder pain and, and shoulder patients. So um, it's, uh, I, I've just learned a ton since, uh, since working with them. Now, that said, we've got a couple questions in the chat and um, Dr. Wagner, they are directed for you. You can take um, this first one. Yeah. And let me go back to the chat. Where'd it go? Hold on a second. I lost my chat function there. Well, this is, give me one second. Um, okay, so the first question here is, so when you do, and it's about the injection protocol that we use, when you do a pec minor and a suprascapular notch injection, do you do them sequentially or at the same time? And then following that up, if you do them sequentially, how far apart do you space them? And do we use um, steroid or just anesthetic? 
Yeah, no, wonderful, wonderful question. Um, absolutely wonderful question. And if you look in the literature, there's there's lots of very variability on this. So we have a standardized protocol. Happy to send out to anybody that's interested, and I'm sure uh, uh, Bauer, Dr. Bowers would also. Um, so what we do is, depending on their pain, depending on their presentation. Let's say you you come in, you think they have thoracic outlet, they have they have pain, they have tenderness around the coracoid, maybe they have a kind of uh, medial or posterior radiant shoulder pain, maybe they don't. Um, we start out with a super scapular notch injection with with uh, li with lidocaine and with corticosteroids. And the idea with that is, do patients get immediate relief or do they get some sort of sustained relief, just like you would with a carpal tunnel or a cubital tunnel injection? Um, then a couple weeks later, so somewhere between two and four weeks later, depending on Dr. Bauer's schedule, depending on um, uh, the patient's schedule, they will have a lidocaine only injection into the pectoralis minor. And the idea is a lidocaine only injection. We're not necessarily trying to treat the pectoralis minor, minor, minor issue with that because naturally the whole brachial plexus is underneath it. Um, you could argue maybe we could throw in some steroids, but I just don't believe that steroids really would do that much to it. It's a, it's a contracted muscle. It's, it's a tight muscle. It's not really inflammation like the super shepherd notch. And so we do lidocaine only. And then uh, Dr. Bauer texts me and, 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 and tells me a patient that he did this injection. And usually that evening, um, potentially even the next morning, I will reach out to the patient, ask them to do a variety of different maneuvers, um, whatever it was that was replicating their pain and ask them if they got pain relief from it. And like I said, a 50, 60% or greater pain relief, being able to do these different maneuvers in my mind is a positive response. Um, we are currently exploring the role of like Botox and, and if you Botox spectrum, does that, does that help to diagnose it? I can't imagine it really helps to treat it. Lots of studies have shown that it doesn't really work so well in treating this, but nobody's, there's not been as much in the diagnostic algorithm. And, you know, we're in the process of refining this diagnostic algorithm as there's not a lot of really good science behind this. If you notice, I didn't quote a lot of studies, partly because there's not just like really good science behind this. Traditionally, this is a vascular surgeon's um, sort of approach. And the vascular surgeons would take out the first rib. They do this big scalenectomy. They do this um, kind of trans actually where they go up through the armpit. And then you can imagine all the, the sort of complications, you know, 25, 30% complication rates of these surgeries. So this is something that like, if I can be frank, has not been really scientifically investigated thoroughly at this point. And, um, you know, I hope over the next five, 10 years, you're going to learn a lot more. Um, I showed you some of what we know, but hopefully we're going to know a lot more in the next, uh, next decade or so. Great. Um, anything else to add and, to that, Bauer? Yeah. The only thing that I would add is that I've played around with the, the different volumes to use for the PEC minor injection. Uh, and then also have not just lidocaine, I've put some rupivacaine in it too, just to get a prolonged response, just to, to kind of let it, um, since Dr. Wagner will, will contact them later that night. And so, but from a volume standpoint, played around with something between 10 and 15 cc's. If you look in the literature, I mean, there are some that note a much larger volume than that, but usually we'll do around, um, 10 and 15 cc's. And then, yeah, from a, from a super scapular notch standpoint, I've thought of using, using more volume, but generally use around um, five cc's or just a mixture of local anesthetic and, and not a lot of corticosteroid, just use a half cc of dexamethasone typically. Um, so that's really the only thing I'll, I'll have to add. And that was the that was the main question that we had. I don't see any any others in the, the chat function. So we'll let everyone um, go and uh, enjoy the rest of their evening. So thanks again to everybody for, for attending this installment of the Fellows Online Lecture Series. Um, if, if you uh, are able to, please go to the chat function and click on the Survey Monkey and, and fill out the, the feedback form. That would be outstanding. Otherwise, just remember uh, the next installment is November 24th on sports psychology. And we will see you then. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful night.